So I was a full-time mom homeschooling the children. And at that point, my husband, Trevor, wanted to move us from state to state to state. About every three years, he would up and move our family and he'd start a new business. And he used religion to continue to control me. This is, you know, you submit to your husband. God's place for you to be is in the home. I didn't have access to a car and everything that I needed, I had to depend on him. And so what finally happened was he moved us to Florida. We joined a, uh, a church and I felt very comfortable and I really connected with a lot of people at this church. So I went to the church and I went to the pastor and I asked him if he would call our previous churches and start asking questions if they saw any strange behavior from my husband, Trevor. They actually told the pastor to protect me and that I was not aware of anything that he was doing and that they were afraid for me. And I had this hidden phone and I used the phone and I called the Spring Outreach Center. And I was on the phone with them and telling them about my situation and they told me that I was definitely sounded to be in a domestic violence situation. So when he came home midday and realized that I used a different device in our home, that's what triggered him to attack me in the house. He pushed me, he dragged me every time I would try to escape and get out the door. And finally, I convinced him to let me go over to his parents' house. Whenever he moved us, he moved his parents with us. And that was really to keep control of me, that his parents would be three adults against one. So we drove around and knocked on friends' doors and we knocked on a, um, a deacon from the church, an older gentleman in his wife's house, and they let us stay with them. And during that time of us staying with the deacon and his wife, uh, the spring helped me to file my first protective order. And um, he was stalking me at this deacon's house. He had already, you know, attacked me. I got out with just the clothes on my back. And from there, I ended up um, working with the Spring Outreach Center and ended up coming into the shelter. So I was in the shelter for a few days while we were trying to get things in line for me to get a safety plan, get a protection order. We went through six months of rebuilding, six months of him stalking me, six months of him terrorizing me. And for six months, it wasn't, I wasn't listened to. Every time I called the police, they didn't believe me. Every time I filed a protective order, the judges didn't believe me. The not being believed um, really went to its peak in March of 2017. So he came into my home in the middle of the night when I was sleeping. He woke me up um, by dropping water on my face. I started throwing everything from my end table at him. And he grabbed me by my feet, bedding and all, and drug me off of my bed. Every time I ran for the front door, he would grab me before I could get it unlocked. I would kick him and scratch at him, trying to just get some distance from him. He had taken scarves and he had tied them to his belt loops. And he took these scarves off of his belt loops and he tied my wrists together and he tied my ankles together and he put a sock in my mouth and he wrapped a scarf around my, around my face. And then he pulled out of his pocket um, a black nylon rope and he wrapped it all around me, cocooning my body. The first about five hours I was tied to the bed like that. And then he untied me, uh, untied me and uh, had sex with me. He then moved me onto my stomach and hogtied me. While I was hogtied, he used my thumbprint to unlock my phone. And he used my phone to make a video. He told me that he was leaving. Uh, he would call one of my friends to come and untie me and he left. And I thought that he was gone. I thought my ordeal was over. But he came in to my room about 40 minutes later with a look of just evil, 
this hatred on his face. And I knew that he was going to be, he was going to kill me. Now was the time that he was going to kill me. He put a pillow over my face and pressed down with his whole upper body until I lost consciousness. My last breath, I knew it was my, 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 my last breath. And I thought to myself, this is it. And then when I came to, he tied my hands behind my back, wrapped a blanket around my shoulders so nobody could see my hands tied behind my back, my back. And he put me in my car and buckled the seatbelt. He drove my car down and stopped at a Walgreens. And he went into the Walgreens to get me NyQuil. He had been drugging me with NyQuil. And with my hands tied behind my back, I used my hands and I reached over and got the seatbelt un unlatched. And then I reached with my hands and I was able to pull the door open. And I got the door open and I just started running and screaming through the Walgreens parking lot. And I started screaming, help me, help me, he's gonna kill me. And a Walgreens employee that was outside on break heard and saw and saw that my hands were tied behind my back and he called 911. And when the police ran my tags, they could see the history, the six months of history of domestic violence that wasn't believed. And they knew that it was, it was a major, a major event. And there was a nationwide search put out. During the 55 hour ordeal, my, um, I was raped four times. I was tied up. He slit my wrist with my hands tied behind me and uh, I miraculously was found alive. It, it's so hard for people to understand that I was tortured for 55 hours. He tried to murder me twice. He raped me four times. But that, that 55 hours of him torturing me is not the worst part of the story. While I was missing, the state of Florida took my children. When I was found, I asked immediately, where are my kids? And they told me I would get my kids back the following day. I went, um, an advocate from the spring went with me and my parents and my support system went with me and we went before a judge to get my, my children back home to me. And they told me that I couldn't have my children back, that my children were in the system and that I would have to go through a dependency case plan and do what the state needed me to do to prove that I was capable of taking care of my five children. I had to have a job, which I had. I had to have a house, which I had. The state had me go through three psych evals because they didn't think that after the ordeal that I went through, that I could be capable of caring for my children. All three state, state assigned psych evals told them to give me my children back. The spring was at every one of my hearings, every step of the way, helping to advocate and helping me to get through that time. I ended up getting three of my children back a few months later, and then the older two, it took almost a full year. So that was hard. It was like, I'm trying my hardest. I am trying to protect myself. I'm trying to protect my kids. The spring was by my side. They were believing everything because they met me. They heard me. They knew that the signs of domestic violence does not mean that I've got two black eyes. Once my children were back home to me, they started getting, finally getting therapy. I was able to have that freedom to get them the help that they needed. And I could plan their appointments and, and see what, what resources they really needed. And whenever I had a question or I needed something, we were able to go to the spring to ask them to go to their outreach center. My kids were able to go to Camp Hope and just make wonderful memories and connect with other kids who had similar stories, but different stories at the same time, but could understand where my kids were coming from and understand them more. So they felt like they weren't alone in it. Anytime we needed them, they've been there.
and that has just given me and my kids the hope and the healing that we needed to know we're not alone in this. We got this. It's not about the bad stuff that has happened. It's about knowing that there is a life out there on the other side. You have no idea how wonderful and how great it is, but you just have to take that one step of saying, I'm gonna trust myself. And I'm gonna trust the people that have been there and know what it is that I'm going through and gonna help me, to help me to realize this is what you're experiencing, you're not crazy. We believe you, we know what it's like, and we're gonna be there.